Hello, I'm Herman Eberhardt, the Supervisory Museum Curator at the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, back again to explore another compelling artifact from our museum collection. Like the museum collections at other presidential libraries, ours includes many clothing items owned and used by the President and First Lady. Some of these items connect us to powerful stories about the Roosevelts. That's certainly the case with the two objects we'll be looking at today, these World War II era American Red Cross uniforms. The uniform on the left is a summer issue suit made of seersucker fabric. The one on the right is made of wool and designed for use in cooler weather. Both of these uniforms belong to First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and they have a story to tell us about an important and dangerous journey she made at the height of World War II. Eleanor Roosevelt was often on the move during the war years. She visited defense factories, military bases, and hospitals across the nation, and made overseas trips to demonstrate U.S. support for allied nations and to visit with American soldiers, sailors, and nurses. During these sometimes lengthy journeys, she gathered firsthand information on matters ranging from diplomacy to troop morale and health care that she shared with FDR on her return. The First Lady's most ambitious wartime trip was a five-week tour of the Southwestern Pacific War Zone that she undertook in August and September of 1943. Mrs. Roosevelt went to the Pacific as an official representative of the American Red Cross. And these uniforms are the ones she wore during that trip. In all the photos of her in the South Pacific that you'll see in this presentation, she is wearing one of these two uniforms. I should mention here that Mrs. Roosevelt was involved in American Red Cross activities in both World War I and World War II. During the First World War, she worked in a Red Cross canteen at Washington, D.C.'s Union Station. When she became First Lady in 1933, she began serving as the National Organization's Honorary Vice Chair, and during the 1930s, she helped the Red Cross raise funds and assist refugees. After the outbreak of World War II, Mrs. Roosevelt's activities with the Red Cross increased. During the war, she personally contributed $1,200 a year to the organization. That's equivalent to nearly $20,000 a year in today's dollars. More importantly, she attended Red Cross conventions and meetings and publicized the organization's blood drives and other activities in radio speeches and newspaper and magazine articles. The First Lady also toured Red Cross facilities and made reports on their operations. During a 1942 trip to England, for instance, she visited Red Cross canteens and recreation centers, greeting soldiers and examining the quality of the facilities and services. Eleanor's extensive wartime travels, including her trips on behalf of the Red Cross, were widely praised, but some critics in the media and public accused her of wasting tax money on what they called pointless or political junkets. Racists, who were angered by her advocacy for African-American civil rights and her opposition to racial segregation in the military, attacked her for being photographed with black servicemen and women. Mrs. Roosevelt ignored all these opponents, focusing instead on the outpouring of support that she received from families who wrote to thank her for visiting their loved ones overseas. Eleanor's Pacific journey began on August 17, 1943. Before departing, she compiled this list of the vast distances between the different stops on her tour. She would be gone for over a month, moving from Hawaii to New Zealand, Australia, and 17 Pacific Islands, including Bora Bora, Samoa, Fiji, New Caledonia, Christmas Island, and Guadalcanal. Traveling in military transport planes, she would be putting herself at risk to visit hospitals and military camps. Throughout her trip, the First Lady documented her experiences in her nationally syndicated My Day newspaper column, which at its height appeared six days a week in 90 newspapers, reaching an audience of over 4 million people. Her trip would demonstrate American support for our allies in New Zealand and Australia, but more importantly, it would give her the opportunity to meet with soldiers, sailors, and nurses stationed on remote islands cut off from their families and friends. The First Lady commented about this aspect of her journey in her first My Day column about the trip. She wrote, 
I am about to start on a long trip, which I hope will bring to many women a feeling that they have visited the places where I go and that they know more about the lives their boys are leading. Well, Eleanor certainly understood how the mothers of children serving overseas felt because her four sons were all serving in America's military during the war and two had been stationed in the Pacific. Now, the military commanders in the Pacific Theater, especially Admiral William F. Halsey, the Allied commander in the South Pacific, were unhappy at first with the First Lady's plans. Admiral Halsey was concerned that she would be a distraction from the war effort. He had complained before about members of Congress and other officials who insisted on coming to the Pacific to make personal inspections of the front lines. But he and the other military leaders quickly changed their minds when they saw Mrs. Roosevelt in action. She threw herself into her work with her usual tireless manner, spending long days visiting hospitals, recreation centers, and rehabilitation facilities. Her son James had told her to eat with the enlisted men, not just the officers, if she wanted to know what was really happening, and she did. She gave speeches to Army and Navy audiences, toured bases, and after finishing her official duties, sat down each day to write her daily newspaper column. All of this made a deep impression on Admiral Halsey, who completely changed his view of the First Lady. Halsey was especially impressed with Mrs. Roosevelt's visits to hospital wards. And this is what he had to say about that. Here is what Eleanor Roosevelt did in 12 hours. She inspected two Navy hospitals, took a boat to an officer's rest home, and had lunch there, returned and inspected an Army hospital, reviewed the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion, made a speech at a service club, attended a reception, and was guest of honor at a dinner given by General Harmon. When I say she inspected those hospitals, I don't mean that she shook hands with the chief medical officer, glanced into a sunroom, and left. I mean that she went into every ward, stopped at every bed, and spoke to every patient. What was his name? How did he feel? Was there anything he needed? Could she take a message home for him? I marveled at her hardihood, both physical and mental. She walked for miles, and she saw patients who were grievously and gruesomely wounded. But I marveled most at their expressions as she leaned over them. It was a sight I will never forget. Here is a shot of Mrs. Roosevelt meeting with Admiral Halsey, whose respect and gratitude she had won. That's him on the right. Halsey later wrote of Eleanor, I was ashamed of my original surliness. She alone had accomplished more good than any other person or group of civilians who had passed through my area. Behind them, by the way, you can see the transport plane that Eleanor has traveled on with the nose art that reads, if you look closely, Our Eleanor. Now, the most powerful part of Mrs. Roosevelt's Pacific trip occurred near the end when she visited Guadalcanal Island. Guadalcanal was the site of some of the hardest fighting of the Pacific War. A bloody campaign raged there from August 1942 until February 1943. The island was now serving as a temporary home for wounded troops. Eleanor's trip to Guadalcanal was a rough one. Her plane, an unheated military aircraft, took off at 1.30 a.m., flying lights out at night to prevent detection by enemy aircraft. The night before she arrived, the Japanese bombed the island, and an air raid warning actually sounded while she was there. The island would be bombed again the night after she left. On the island, she greeted soldiers, who were surprised to see her because there had been no advance notice of her visit. She inspected recreational and medical facilities. And she visited the island's chapel and military cemetery, which made a deep impression on her. As she later wrote in a diary she kept during the trip, one of the things which I will never forget on Guadalcanal is my visit to the cemetery. It was very moving to walk among the graves and to see how united these boys had been in spite of differences of religion and race and background. The boy's mess kit and sometimes his helmet hung on the cross and appropriate symbols to the Jewish, Catholic and Protestant faith would be carved by the dead boy's friends. Words that came from the heart were carved on the base, such as, he was a grand guy, best buddy ever. 
The cemetery is carefully tended and flags wave over the graves. As I noted earlier, Guadalcanal was one of the last stops on Eleanor Roosevelt's Pacific trip. On September 23rd, she boarded her final flight from Hawaii back to the American mainland. Her trip had been the longest, most grueling, and most dangerous of her years as First Lady. During her five-week odyssey, she had traveled 25,000 miles by air and had been seen by an estimated 400,000 servicemen and women. Constantly on the move, she had lost 30 pounds during her travels. It was a journey that left her, in her words, as exhausted as I have ever been in my life. During her return trip to the mainland, she drafted a nine-page memo for the Red Cross, suggesting improvements to their operations. She also wrote recommendations for FDR. Her visits with gravely injured men during her journey had left her shaken. She would never forget the smell of the burn wards. She told her husband about the hospital wards filled with the wounded and included accounts of servicemen suffering from battle fatigue and exhaustion that we now refer to as PTSD. FDR was so affected by that part of her report that he pressed the military to take action. I know that the Army and Navy are doing the best they can with, with the subject of fatigue and stress, FDR wrote to the Secretaries of War and the Navy, but I wish that further special consideration be given in all combat services. Mrs. Roosevelt's visit to the South Pacific left a deep and lasting impression on her. Her young friend, Sergeant Joseph Lash, whom she saw during the trip, wrote that the First Lady was, quote, agonized by the men she had seen in the hospitals, fiercely determined because of them to be relentless in working for a peace that this time will last. In one of her My Day columns, she tried to find meaning in her experiences and the sacrifices of the war dead whose graves she had visited. The way to honor their sacrifices, she wrote, was to, quote, make our lives count. We must build up the kind of world for which these men died. They may never have put it into words, but I think they wanted a world where no one is hungry or in want for the necessities of life. Long ago, a man told me the big thing men got out of war was the sense of shared comradeship and loyalty to each other. Perhaps that is what we must develop at home to build the world for which our men are dying. When we look at Eleanor Roosevelt's Red Cross uniforms today, we are reminded of her commitment to build that better world. We recall her lifetime of service to others. She was a woman driven by a powerful desire to be useful, to help, to make a difference in the lives of others. That was very much the case with her wartime work with the Red Cross, and it was especially evident during her trip to the South Pacific. I hope you've enjoyed this program about Eleanor Roosevelt's Red Cross uniforms. I'll be back again soon to talk about another interesting artifact from the museum collection. If you want to learn more about these uniforms and other objects in our museum, I encourage you to take our virtual museum tour and explore our digital artifact collection. Both are available on our website.